How's that? Is that better? Okay. Did you get my good side? Is this my good side? I bet. I would like this. Is it better? This. Is it better? No. No. It it shows that my weakness, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm revealing my weakness to you there. All right. I'm going to make a statement tonight that um, uh, is kind of important to make. I hope everybody's got notes because we are going to be looking. We're embarking on a study of prayer. Uh, we're, we're seeking if we find a way to make a prayer life, not just doing prayer, but a prayer life. Uh, so before we get into the study, I just want to make a statement here. I have a, a small package here for people who are uh, looking for a form, something they can use uh, in um, if you have a religious objection to having a vaccine. Now, let me state what that means so that you'll understand where we're coming from. That does not mean you prefer not to get the vaccine. If that's your situation, you really don't. You'll just that you're on your own for that. That's not a religious conviction. A religious conviction means that you believe something so strongly you'd be willing to die for it. A lot of us have things we say are convictions, but we really mean preference by that. We would prefer to do it this way. If it came down to push and shove, you would do it uh, their way. But that's not a religious conviction if you're just simply saying, I don't want to have one. You need to know, one, what is the vaccine? What's involved with the vaccine? What's its source? What are you doing with it? What are they doing with it? What's the result of it when it happens? Okay. According to the CDC's own VAER um, statistics, 13,000 people have died from it already. Over 600,000 um, uh, um, variants are not, when I, if I say variant, that sounds like I'm talking about uh, variants to the COVID, and that's not what I mean at all, but adverse effects, I'll say it that way, Six, over 600,000 adverse effects that cover all kinds of things. You need to look for that yourself. You need to know that's what that is, and then search the scriptures and see if there's something you have a religious conviction about. You don't just simply want to find some form that gets you away from doing something. That's not acceptable. Um, sometimes people have asked me to witness something for them, uh, indicating that their pastor understands their conviction and so forth. I will sign that if you can show me that really is your spiritual, religious, biblical conviction. If it's not, I won't sign it because I'm putting my name on that saying, I know this is your conviction. And if it's really just a preference or just something you don't want to do, I can't sign that. Does everybody understand where we're coming from? So make sure that you know what you are asking for, what you're doing. Uh, make sure that you have a good conviction. So search the scriptures. Um, there, there are plenty of things in there, I believe, that you could uh, look from the scriptures that would give you good advice. But um, that's not mine to tell. I'm not a medical person, so I'm, I cannot give you that kind of advice or information. I can pass on to you as a religious person, that's the way that I'm looked at, um, some religious convictions about things, some of the religious statements about it. But that may not be the only ones you want. So if you want one of those, I can give you those. But I'm not trying to give you medical advice. Everybody understand where I'm coming from? I'm not trying to give you medical advice. That's, I'm not qualified to do that. Okay. Now, having said that, let's, let's start a, a study of prayer tonight. Tonight we're going to look at the foundations of prayer and just look a few things over. I hope that we can uh, get an opportunity to get a few, a few things done with that. Where Al and I are going with this, we're going to be looking at as many of the prayers of the Bible as we can. We're going to look them over, and you're going to be kind of surprised at how many different things we count as prayer. Uh, when you see someone in heaven talking to someone else in heaven, that's a prayer. That's a communication that's going on, okay? Um, when you see the people in Jesus' day speaking to Jesus, they're having a conversation with Jesus. We're looking at those as prayers. That's a conversation you're having with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, there's some prayers in the, the usual category we have for them where people are asking Jesus specifically to do something. That is prayer. 
but prayer is also asking Jesus to do something for somebody else. So that's also prayer. But it's also prayer when you're asking Jesus to clarify, what did you mean when you said? So when the disciples are saying to Jesus, okay, that parable we just gave there, that was tough. What did you mean by that? Well, then once you've seen that, once you've understood that, that's prayer. You, you've seen when um, the, there's a the bug flying around you guys there. So it's a mosquito, a fly. <laughs> when when uh, Jonah is in the uh, ship and it's got all kinds of problems happening for him, they're tossed all over the sea, the guys in the ship cried out to God. They cried out to all the other gods first. Then they cried out to God and God spared them. That's a prayer. You would find that in Psalm 107 the same way. Uh, so we're going to be looking at as many of the prayers. Cain is obviously having a discussion with God. That's a prayer. Uh, and he's, he's got some things he wants to ask God. So um, having said that, let's take a look at our outline for tonight. Uh, we'll start with a word of prayer, and then we'll go to the outline. Father, thank you so much for the privilege we get to have of looking into the Word of God, of seeing what you have to say for us, of teaching us. We want to learn. We, we are your people, and we admit that uh, we're newborn in this. We don't really know how to do the things you want done, but we know that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are going to teach us how to do those things. And to that end, we want to thank you tonight, give you praise for what you're going to do in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right. Let's talk about first, what is prayer? Let's ask this question. Is it a work of the law? It is a work. It's, there's, there's hard work that's involved with it. Matter of fact, some of the New Testament fellows, when they are spoken of a praying for, for instance, Epaphroditus and Epaphras, are both mentioned as people who prayed for the brothers and sisters at their church, Colossae and Ephesus, respectively. When they prayed, the word that was used was they agonized for them. They wrestled for them. They hurt for them. Uh, they, they knew how important it was to grow. Now, just, just get the picture. If you remember, Ephesus was one of those cities that was an idolatrous place. It was an immoral place. It was a spiritual place. Remember, they had all kinds of spirits there. There were Jewish uh, demon exercisers who were there that were exercising demons. Paul exercised demons. There was a lot of witchcraft going on in um, Ephesus. Now, just imagine when you are Epaphras and you've gone away from them for a while and you're trying to think about your brothers and sisters back there. How, what kind of a battle are they in, engaged in? If you remember when Paul's going to write to that church at Ephesus, that's where we get that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of the age, spiritual wickedness in high places. Epaphras is remembering that's what's going on in Ephesus. And he's got brothers and sisters who are contending with powers that are greater than their humanity. Will their humanity overwhelm at all? Or will their, the fact that they are spiritual creatures now, that overwhelm it? Will they count on the Holy Spirit? Or will they try to count on their own abilities? Will they try to count on their own flesh? Will they try to count on their own reasoning to get them through it? So here's Epaphras. He's going to pray for them, but it's called agonizing. He's hurting for them. He wants to make sure, the Lord, keep them safe. So he's wrestling against the, the principalities and powers that want to eat the people at Ephesus up. Epaphroditus said that same kind of situation. I hope I'm not mixing those guys up. At Colossae, he wanted to work for them. Is it a work of the law, though? No, it's not a work of the law. Uh, so let's go to the next one. Is it a discipline? Uh, it does discipline us. But some people want to change it into one of the spiritual disciplines. Reading the Bible is a spiritual discipline. Uh, praying is a spiritual dis discipline. Meditation is a spiritual discipline. And I'm understanding what they want to say by that. But guys, after a while, we're human enough that we start depending on the discipline instead of the conversation I'm supposed to be having. So I'm counting the fact that I formulated the right kind of prayer. I said it the right way. I said it the number of times that I needed to say it. I'm in the discipline of getting it done. Now, look, if your discipline does not create freedom for you, you've got the wrong discipline. Discipline is supposed to set you up for a habit that you get into that you can 
shove all kinds of new life into it every day. You know, it's, it's easy enough. I'm thinking of uh, weight builders here. One of the guys I really appreciate is Jocko Willink. Uh, that's not a believer. That's just a, a, a former Navy SEAL that is quite a good, a good fellow with stories and bodybuilding and that sort of thing. But he wrote a book called Discipline Equals Freedom. And I understood what he meant by that. Because when you are disciplined, when you have a discipline in your life, you are free now to change your schedule as you need to change it because you've practiced the discipline. So if prayer is a discipline that way, then it is a spiritual discipline. But if that discipline doesn't set you free to be able to, to pray the way you ought to pray, it wasn't a good discipline. You were doing something more pharisaical than you were doing as a spiritual person. Discipline, uh, if, you, if you'll read a lot of times with the discipline, it has something to do with, most often it said, uh, to train someone uh, to, to, do, uh, to follow certain commands and orders and punish them if they don't and re- reward them if they do and that sort of thing. Well, obviously, prayer is not going to be that way. Nobody here in the church is going to beat you up for not praying the right way. We're probably not going to be able to, not going to send Al out to spank you because you didn't have your prayers this morning. You, you follow where we're coming from? We're not going to have that kind of discipline. It, it means to train or develop by instruction and exercise, especially in self-control. In other words, you're, you're going to discipline yourself. You're going to practice doing the things over and over. If you have difficulty saying, I, I don't know how to pray on a, for a certain thing, then you can ask your brothers and sisters how they're doing it and instruct each other with it. But if I'm understanding the Scriptures right, it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us how to pray anyway. So you want to be uh, open to the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 teaches us that when we don't know how to pray as we ought, the Spirit who knows the mind of God makes intercession for us, making sounds that we don't know how to make, bringing our, our messages, the things that He knows are, is on our hearts that we're not able to speak, or the things that obviously there are many times I do not know how to pray as I ought to pray. I, I, I don't know what would be the best thing to pray for in any given situation. I don't know what to ask God for, but I know what I'd like to see as an end result. But if I dictate to God what I think the steps are to get that end result, I may miss the whole thing. I, I'm wanting to know the end result, so time, sometimes it's better for me not to dictate to God what I think He needs to do to get to that point. Just simply say to Him, Father, I know this will bring glory to the kingdom, so I'd like to ask you to do it that way. Would, would you bring this about? And then count on the Holy Spirit to make that known in some way or another, to ask to make the steps that need to be made to get that done. So it's, <clears throat> it's not a means. In other words, if you're going to use prayer as a means to gain favor with God, you've missed what grace is. It's not gaining favor with God at all. It's something that you're doing because you're in favor with God. You're already in a relationship. It's not, you're not going to earn a relationship with them. What you're going to do is keep making your relationship. Look, look it's, it's just like with a friend. When you have a friend, uh, you, you want to keep talking with a friend. And you keep talking about the things that that friend's interested in, and that friend's going to be doing the same thing to you. So you are talking about the same kinds of things. And if your friend says, I don't know what to do about this, if you've got anything that you want to help them with, you provide that help. Well, what we're doing in prayer, we're having conversation with God, and we're reading the Word of God, being informed by the Word of God. What, what does God like? So that I can ask Him to do the things that I know He already likes for my friends. I got friends out there that maybe they're not saved, or, or maybe they are saved and they're having a tough walk right now. They're having struggles with things. Maybe there's enough pressure being put on them from someplace else that they're struggling with their walk. They're, they're getting buried by it. So I want God to help my friend in some way or another. So let's, let's go on, intercession. Is it meritorious? I mean by that, do you gain more favor with God? Do you get things because you, you prayed? Well, is it not enough to have answers to prayer? If you ask God for something, he answers the prayer, what merit are you wanting? <laughs> You know, you, you, you got an answer to prayer. Here's a beautiful thing. God has said, you ask me, I will do. Well, if you ask him and he does, what more do you need? You don't need something to be meritorious. He gave you what you were asking for, all right? Is it a duty? 
Now, that's kind of related to the previous one. Is it a discipline? Is it a duty? Is this something I have to do? Will I lose out my rewards for the day if I don't pray? Oh, you know, if, if, I, if I wake up in the morning and I decide I'm just not going to talk to Char all morning, when she leaves the house, what is she going to think is going on? Was I angry? Was I upset? Was I preoccupied with something? She's going to think of the worst. And if I don't have a conversation with her, then I don't know what's on her mind either. And I might be just easily uh, confused and say, you know, she really didn't talk to me this morning. Well, I didn't initiate a conversation. She didn't initiate a conversation. Neither of us know what's going on in the other's mind right now. And whether I like it or not, that's going to set my day in the wrong category because I'm already going to be thinking, what's going on here? Why, why did that happen? It's the same way with my father. I want to have conversation with my father. I want, to, I want to talk with him. He's my life. He's got everything going for me, so you want to have that conversation with him. So it's, don't consider it a duty. Uh, husbands, it's not your duty to talk to your wife in the morning. Wives, it's not your duty to talk. It's, it's not your duty. It's your privilege. God wants you to be talking to your spouse or your friends or whoever it is. So let's get the letter E then. Is this on? Is this, this is going okay, okay, because I, I can't hear it, and I'm uh, thinking I, I forgot to turn it on or something. Prayer flows from a relationship with God. That's where it's coming from. It comes out of a relationship with God. <clears throat> it is a privilege that God has given mortals that we can speak to him, address him at all, and address him about common things in our life. That is a privilege. So uh, prayer flows from a relationship with God. Number one under that is prayer is a conversation with the personal God who understands the language of the petitioner and is able to respond to the request. It arises out of need. When I'm coming to the Lord in prayer, I'm understanding I'm the lesser, he's the greater. I'm needing to speak to him because I'm in need. He's, he's not in need. Of, I mean, I'm not going to fulfill a need for him today. He delights in having his children talk to him. It's a privilege to be able to get to do so, but it arises out of a need. Here's a funny thing I found. Every time I get to feeling like I'm self-sufficient with doing something, my prayer life just goes in the tank because I don't, I don't think I need him anymore. And that, when I don't need him anymore, reduces my relationship. It also reduces my capacity to understand what he has to say because I can't hear him anymore. I, I'm not needing him, so I, I can only hear what, what is that needful stuff. And if I don't have any needful stuff, then the rest of it just doesn't make much sense. Everybody see where I'm coming from? All right. So it's a conversation with a personal God. And I, I've got to think of this. God is a person. He's not an idea. He's not a concept. He's not an energy. He has energy, no doubt about it, but he's not an energy. He's a person. And if I don't think of him as a person that I can have conversation with, I'm going to miss out on a whole lot that's with him. Okay? I'm going to tr start treating him kind of like he's at the local ATM machine. I put in my card. He gives me back the money. And that's not much of a friendship or a relationship. Hard to have a relationship with an ATM machine. Okay? Number two, prayer is a conversation with the intention of deepening the relationship with God. Why do you have conversations with your friends? One, you enjoy them. But so much so you want to keep deepening that relationship. Well, that's the way it is with God. He is a person that you can actually deepen the relationship with. Draw near to him. He will draw near to you. So the more that you get to know him, the more you get to understand what life is really all about, how things really operate, and how you can solve your, the problems that God's giving to you. So prayer is a conversation with the intention of deepening the relationship with God. Number three, prayer is an action of discovering more about the one to whom prayer is being offered. See all these uh, banners we've got around here? <clears throat> and you'll see 
each of them have the Jehovah name on them. Okay, that's that is an anglicized way of saying J H V H or Y H W H. Uh, that that is the anglicized word of saying. That's Jehovah. That is the name. His name up there. That is the name he goes by. Well, then, what's the shalom? That is a description of something that God does. So uh, these names, you'll see, first of all, here's the name, and then there's something that he does beneath that. So he is Jehovah Shammah. He is the Shammah. He's the one who stays present with us. But it's Jehovah, that's his name. Shammah, that's a description of what he does. That comes through prayer. That comes through talk. That comes through an experience with God. It's, it's not, well, is God this name or that name? Yes. He's this name and this name and this name and this name, depending on what is your need at the time. Is it sickness? Perhaps you, you want to cry out to Jehovah Rapha because that's the word which means healer. And that's the one you cry. But you're not crying out to one of eight gods. These are eight descriptions of what this God does. Does that, does that make sense? Let me see where that, where that one at. So uh, prayer is an action of discovering more about the one to whom prayer is being offered. When, when, they got to, when the children of Israel got trapped between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea, they're crying out. And they're crying out to Almighty God, what are you going to do about this? And again, they're crying out to the Almighty God. He's the only one that had the strength to do what needed to be done. So they're crying out to Almighty God. Almighty God splits the waters, and they go through. That came as a direct answer to prayer. But when they got to the other side, well, can God provide for us? Can God, can God take care of us while we're out here? We don't want this, this water is bitter, and it's going to make everybody sick. And so God says, put this tree in the water, and the waters turn sweet. And that's when he said to them, I am the Lord who heals you. So they're crying out prayer to keep them from sickness. His response is, now Jehovah Rapha. They discovered more about him because they were in a need. So prayer is when you're crying out to him, you're discovering more about what this God can do. I know uh, years ago, we, um, we had a pretty serious need here. We were uh, about 75 people, 100 people, and we had a debt of about $454,000. We were making a huge payment, building payment every month. We were in pretty deep debt and pretty serious. And um, we, as a board, got together. We asked God what to do about that, and we asked God to help us get through this debt, and we would not go in debt again. And... There were some didn't think that was a good plan because you can't do things that way. But we watched Yahweh Yira, the Lord who sees ahead. That's what pro video means. You know, when you are pro means to look ahead. Video means that's the look part. The pro part is to see before. So you're looking before. Provision means I've looked ahead. I see what I'm going to have to have when I get there. You, you, you do that when you take your tools with you. you. You're recognizing what kind of tools am I going to need when I get there. Oh, I didn't get the ladder. Put the ladder on today because you provided for what you needed at that job. Well, we, we called out to Yahweh Yira to provide for us. And kids, I got to tell you, some of the most amazing things happen in those years. We, we saw sometimes when the, the Father gave to us gifts we had no idea, we, were, we didn't know anything about. Matter of fact, uh, I think it was within two weeks of the time that we had committed ourselves to not go in debt again. I got a call from an attorney who said, uh, is this the Edgemont Bible Church? I said, yes, it is. He said, is this where so-and-so uh, goes to church? I said, I don't know that name. He said, that's, that's a foolish question on my part. She's been in um, a, a nursing home now for the last 10 years or whatever it was. I said, oh, okay. I, I don't know that name. I don't know her. He said, well, she passed away, and she had no family, and she's left um, a gift to the church. So within two weeks' time of us saying we're not going to debt, there was $49,000 settlement that came in. 
And kids, I watched that happen week, sometimes within two weeks of times it would happen again. It would happen in months. It, would, it just kept happening that way as Yahweh Yira, who saw ahead for what the need was, met the need. And he's done that for us the whole time. That's, that's been with teachers in, needed in Iwana or leaders needed in trail life or American Heritage Girls or things like that. When we have a need, we cry out to God. He meets that need. So now I knew him as Yahweh. I already knew he's the self, self-sustaining God. But we've discovered more about him through prayer. We've discovered that he can provide that. Can God do this? Can God do that? Yes, he can do all kinds of things, and you discover it through prayer. All right. Prayer number four is asking, requesting, confessing, pleading, interceding with, praising, giving thanks, and petitioning God. So prayer is not any one thing, but that part of that conversation, sometimes your conversation is just simply, I got to praise you. (laughs) You are so awesome, I got to praise you. Sometimes it's to thank you so much. What a great provision that was for our family today. Thank you, I appreciate the way you did that. That was beautiful. Sometimes it's confessing. Father, I am such a nut. Why do I do these things? And here's my sin. I am a self-centered fool. I lie, I cheat, I steal. All of that's still inside me, and I know I can't do it. So I want to thank you that you've given me this, this privilege of confession. So sometimes it's confession. Sometimes it's crying out for your friends. It's a petition. It's interceding. All right. Then number six, prayer is full of respect and respectful language. Now, kids, I'm, I'm all for knowing that you are friends with God, but he's not your equal. And your language needs to be respectful enough. Do I, am I saying you need to speak King James? Not at all. It's not about these and thous and thines. It's not about that. It's about that you know that the God you're addressing is really the God. He's really the one who speaks things into existence. You're, you're not talking to your buddy down the street. This is not your pool partner. This is God Almighty who is in control of all things. So your prayers should be full of respect and respectful language. Now, that's not a question of the mouth. That's a question of the heart. All right? And I think we'll see more of that as we go. Letter F, prayer implies humility, for it recognizes the one being petitioned is greater than the one employing it. So if you, if you come to God as an equal, you're missing prayer. You're, you're not praying now. Uh, prayer is that, that you're recognizing the one being petitioned is greater than you are. You're coming in a need or you wouldn't be, I mean, if, even if you're confessing, you're admitting in, humbly that there is someone to whom you are accountable. There's someone greater than you. You might not really be your own boss. <laughs> there might be somebody who's really over you. So prayer is an act of humility where you're recognizing that he's greater than you. Uh, it's, it's someone that's uh, or more able than the one petitioning him. So you're recognizing that th- you are beyond your resources. You don't know how to do this. You can't do this. Uh, and so because you can't do it, you're crying out to him to, uh, to accomplish that which you know you cannot. And that will not work for the self-sufficient. If you feel like you can do all this, you can, you'll need God for certain things, then that your prayer is going to be very shallow and very uh, uh, narrow. We are praying for everything. As a matter of fact, we'll come to that in just a minute. So it implies humility. Letter G, prayer implies faith or confidence that God will hear the request and is able to grant it. Let's go, yes. Oh, prayer may be responded. Did I miss that one? Sorry about that. Prayer may be responding to God who has made a request of a person. It's responding to the call of God. Here is uh, Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 6 just a minute, okay? Isaiah 6. Got a different new Bible tonight, and I can see I'm going to have my cheaters for sure on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you think I can see it better there? Okay. Uh, 
In the year of King Uzziah's death, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, so it's going to sound perhaps different than what you're reading. In the year of the King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. What would you call that? That's humility. And what, what specific words is that going to be? You see confession in that? There's confession. And I live among a people of unclean lips, so I'm one among many. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with his tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. That is responding to a call. That's prayer, where uh, God's called out to you and said, Who are we going to send? And your response was, send me. I'm right here. So that's responding to a call of God. And that's a, that's a prayer. When um, uh, Peter is being challenged to uh, become one of the disciples, and he's saying to him, Lord, you know, get out, don't, don't get near my ship. I'm not worthy to be where you are. That is a confession of sin. And the response is, then I will follow you wherever you're going. Okay? So that's, that's also a prayer. Thank you for bringing it up because I... I didn't. All right. Uh, letter G. Fit prayer implies faith or confidence that God will hear the request and is able to grant it. So for this, let's go to First John chapter five. Just a minute. First John chapter five. First John five fourteen. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay, so the statement we're making here, prayer implies faith or confidence that God will hear the request. And then it says, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. So how many times do you see ask in there? So that's prayer. Here's a person making a request. If we ask anything, uh, he hears us. We know if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request of which we have asked. So he's saying here, I have the confidence of this, that when I ask anything according to his will, he hears it. If he hears it, I have it. It's mine. So it's got to be the confidence that not only is he able to do it, but he will do it. So prayer implies faith. Let's go to the back side of our notes here for tonight. Let's take a look at those. Letter H, regular prayer. Now notice that's just a little bit different than what I'd said before. Prayer, regular prayer implies love for God just as a regular conversation with a husband and wife or a family or with friends does. So if I'm praying regularly, it's because I know I have a relationship going. If I pray only when I have a need, that's like shopping at Aldi's. You know, I, I know that I have a need, so I'm going to go down to Aldi's, pick up what I have a need, but I don't have a relationship with Aldi's other than they're there for every need that I have. But Aldi doesn't take care of me when I'm not having, I mean, it doesn't take care of my hardware needs. It doesn't take care of the, the other needs that I have in my life. But regular prayer implies love. Jesus said it this way, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, there's a relationship, okay? then you will be my disciples. And it all will know that you are my disciples. And whatever you ask, I will do. So, again, it's implying that when I'm in a relationship, that's a stead, steady, uh, continuing relationship. When I have that kind of relationship, he hears me and will answer the things I'm asking for. Okay? So if you're following who we're at so far, what we're t talking about is prayer is not, the tongue, it's about the heart. Am I believing him? Do I love him? 
Uh, is this someone I honestly believe is going to do the things that he said he would do? Let's talk about the postures. Of, well, I should stop a minute and say, any comments or questions or thoughts about what we just finished there, what we went through there? Okay, let's go to postures of prayer. Most often in the Scriptures, the posture of prayer is like that of worship. It's kneeling or prostrate with his face to the ground. Now, oftentimes this is where you're, you're kneeling down. It's not just on, on one knee or even two knees. It's all the way down where you're bowed to the ground. And you, you have your face right on the ground. That's where it is. But prostrates where you are actually laying face down on the ground. Now, that is one of the most harmless positions you could possibly be in. In a kneeling position, there's still a chance you might jump up. You might be able to get up. But once you're prostrate, and you're laying completely out flat. Your arms are, you are not in a position to get up and tackle anybody, run away, do anything else. You have fully surrendered. And when you got your face all the way to the ground, I mean, how, how when the police are going to arrest you, what do they want you to do? Face down on the ground. And they're going to take your arms, put them behind you, and arrest you because that's a position of full surrender. And when you are prostrate before God, you're saying, I'm in full surrender to you. I know I cannot do the things I'm doing here. I know I cannot even please you. I need your help. All right. So the postures. So the first one is kneeling or prostrate with his face to the ground. And letter number one, though prayer is a conversation with another person, he's not an equal person. Prayer must be filled with respect for the person of God. And that's why the prayers often were face down. Out of full respect for God, I am not, I'm not even going to, I don't stand before you. You know, now, I'm not going to tell you that your posture is you can't stand when you pray. That's not what I mean at all. In your mind, if you're standing before God as if you were your own witness for yourself, then you got a wrong attitude about that. Right? So, um, number two, kneeling with the face to the ground reveals the helplessness of the petitioner and prostrate is even more so. Okay. Letter B. Whatever posture is assumed by the petitioner must and will reflect his heartfelt humility before God. Um, if you are standing with your fist in the air, you're not understanding who you're talking to. <laughs> you know. Um, so here's what we're going to say first of all. Check your heart before you set your body. Before you determine what position you're going to be in to pray, Check your heart. Are you doing this out of duty or love? So check your heart there to make sure that you're as Obviously, which one of those should it be? It should be love, right? So you have to check yourself sometimes and just say, you know, uh, am I doing this right now because I'm upset with a friend? I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. Am I going in this posture to reveal my equality to him or my submission to him? Sometimes if it's one of those things where, uh, Lord, I'm, I don't have time right now. I've got to do a quick prayer to you. I'm on my way walking across the parking lot here. So just hear me because I'm, I'm, we're, we're buddies and we're talking here together. Uh, then that may not be the right attitude to have. Certainly you don't come to him in inequality. Let her see. Are you ignoring sin? You're free from guilt. Do you know that you've done something already that is sinful? Are you, as he puts it, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. So if I know I've done some sin and I'm not willing to let that go, then I'm not in a place to pray. I have to be willing to confess what I've done wrong or if I can, correct it with whoever I can. So ignoring sin is no way to come to the Lord in prayer. Letter D, am I coming in the strength of the flesh or the boldness of the Spirit? Um, we are told to come boldly before the throne of grace in Hebrews. So am I coming boldly before the throne of grace because the Spirit of God has empowered me to do that? Or am I coming in the strength of flesh saying, all right, I, I, God said to pray, so I'm going to pray right now. And I'm not praying in Jesus' name or anything else. I'm just praying my kind of prayer. Okay? So I have to... Obviously, you're coming in the boldness of the Spirit is the correct way to go there. Am I doing it in presumption based on exceptionalism 
or faith based on Christ and his revealed will. Let me see if I can tell you what, show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to Isaiah 58 just for a minute. Isaiah 58. There were several times that Israel, in their praying, prayed because they found themselves to be exceptional over other people. They, 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 for the longest time, wouldn't believe that Babylon could possibly tackle them. They didn't believe Babylon could uh, to get them in any way at all because they were the people of God. So their prayers were all based on their exceptionalism, not their position. Their position before him wasn't wholly good and true. As a matter of fact, they were hard-hearted, stiff-necked, and walking away from him. They were idolaters, adulterers because they were worshiping other gods. They were paying attention to the other gods, making offerings to other gods. That's not a true heart before Almighty God. Now, here, look at Isaiah 58. He says, <clears throat> Cry loudly, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression. So let's, let's stop again and, and say this. He's telling Isaiah to speak loudly to the people because they're not hearing. So he's saying, speak louder. I want you to see and declare their transgression. Now, let's, let's look at the three different categories we find of sin. One is the iniquity. Iniquity is the bend I have away from God. It's my will, my desire to do my own will. And that, that twist away from God is what gives me sin. Sin is missing the mark. Because I am bent away from God, I can't hit the mark. I used to use a, 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 the difference between a good aluminum arrow that I had and a bent stick. And I would show that bent stick is the way we are. That's iniquity. That's what a bent stick means. And I'd put that bent stick in my bow, and that, that thing went everywhere. If it went any place else, sometimes it would just, the, the, when I let the string go, the, the arrow would just fall down there. I shot it one time at a camp, stupidly. And it went flying through the room. Um, not on any solid trajectory for him. It just went wherever the bent went, and it was just going all the way. So I decided not to do that again. Okay. Uh, so when I picked up the <laughs> straight, when I picked up the straight arrow to show what God does in removing our iniquity from us and straightens us out, when I put it in the string, crowd split every. <laughs> And I said, I'm not going to fire it, guys. Don't, don't worry. I'm not going to. And one guy said, I didn't think you'd fire the first one. I said, yeah, I know. But, but my point is this. Transgression is different from sin. It is sin. But iniquity is when I'm bent, and sin is the result of my being bent. Like that bent stick, I'm going to travel the way of my bending. Transgression is when I don't care. I want to do things my own way. So notice what he says here. Cry out and declare to my people their transgression. So this is not just missing a mark they're doing. This is not something that's happening accidentally. They are intentionally doing something he told them not to do. Okay? And to the house of Jacob for their sins. Now he's going to share with them, you're missing the mark because of your transgression. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways as a nation that has done righteousness. They're acting like they've done righteous, and they're saying they're seeking my ways day by day and has not forsaken the ordinance of, the, of their God. They ask me for just decisions. That's prayer. They delight in the nearness of God. And they say, why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire. You drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and strike with a wicked fist. Do you hear anything that might be wrong with their heart condition there? All right. Because they have that heart condition, he's not listening to them. Even though they are fasting, they're doing the ritual things that would, you would normally think that's going to make God listen. See, he knows I'm serious. Look at me fasting. See, I'm not eating as if God's impressed by our not eating. That's not a matter of fact, he's going to give them what their heart's desire was. It won't be long until they won't have anything to eat. Then it's not exactly fasting that you wanted to do, okay? So anyway, my, my point was to, to get to, to see this. That is presumption based on exceptionalism. They're saying because we're the people of God, it doesn't matter how we behave. 
God is our, our God, and he will hear us. So we're going to do these things that if, if the idol worshipers do them, their God answers them. So we're going to do these things to prove to God that we, we want answers just like the idolaters get. Well, that didn't work out. Um, is it coming, letter F, is it coming from pride or brokenness? Uh, do, am, I, am I admitting my need? Do I believe I've earned the right to be heard? That because I am righteous and doing good that I, I should be heard right now? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best to attend church all the time. I'm trying my best to give money. I'm trying my best to be kind to people and help people out and stuff. So that gives me the right to be heard, right? No, we're not coming in our righteousness. We're coming in the righteousness of Christ. That's why he told us to pray in his name. And that, I think I've got one down here for that anyway. Um, um, no comparing yourself to other people. If you remember, there was this uh, Pharisee and a, a a uh, publican. Both were in the same place, and they were both praying. They're both in the temple. And the publican is beating his chest, remember, saying, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. And across the way is the publican who's saying, thank you that I'm not like that guy. Well, if your prayer is comparing yourself to other people, you're not praying, and you won't be heard, okay? So is it uh, pride or brokenness that you have uh, and it's not comparing yourself to others. Letter H, coming in your own name or in the name of Christ? And how do you know the difference? If your prayer starts by not having your mind set on what does Christ want and only what you want, then you're going to be coming in your own name, and you're on your own at that point. If, if you think that you're okay to come on your own into the throne of grace, you're sadly mistaken. The only reason you're getting to go there is because the grace of God has converted you and made you a child of God, okay? So uh, is your request in the will of God? Is it from the Word of God? Did you get your request informed by the Word of God? Listen, that's why we stay in the Word. We want to stay in the Word and say, what is it that God wants done? What's the big kingdom principle here? What's he after? How did Jesus pray? Because if I can learn how Jesus prayed, then I can learn how to pray in the will of God. Because I know, and you do, that Jesus always prayed in the will of God. Uh, a few years ago, I read a book by um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, that was called the um, Psalms, the Prayer Book of Jesus. What a fantastic little book. He went through and showed how the prayers of the Psalms are the prayers that Jesus was making. Because here's David being inspired by the Spirit of God to record these songs. Who's inspiring him? And they wind up being the prayers that Jesus is going to pray while he's here on earth. So you look back to read those Psalms again, and he said, well, you know, I've, I've looked over Chronicles, I've looked over Samuel, I've looked over Kings, I don't see any place where, Jesus, where uh, David did something like this. Well, I see right here where Jesus did something like that. So those are the prayers of Jesus. If you want to have a good time sometime, just start making the Psalms your prayer. Look those Psalms over and say, this is, what, this is the way my Lord prayed. This is the way I'm going to pray. Okay? So use the Psalms as a prayer guide for you. Okay? Letter J, are you angry? Are you bitter? Are you vengeful? You're better off to stop before you even go. Don't go there. Don't even go to prayer. Get the Get that stuff squared away first. Talk, do whatever you have to do to get rid of that anger. Replace that anger as quickly as you can. If you have good reason to be angry, then make sure you're not doing something about it. If you want to pray, you can say, Lord, I'm feeling anger right now, and I know this is not right for me to pray right now. Would you please take care of this anger with me? Please bring peace to my heart, and I'll, I'll follow your word best I can. If you're bitter or vengeful, you're better off not to. Then number two. Whatever your posture is going to be, it needs to be a genuine expression of humility, not a culturally learned ritual. That, that could be, if you learn to pray sitting, that doesn't mean sitting was the best way to do it. If you learn to pray while standing, kneeling, hands up, hands down, hands folded, you know, some people won't pray unless they pray, pray with their hands this way. Well, there's, there's nothing magical about praying this way. There's no, no special, that's not a special tower receiver that's going to get the answer to prayer. There's nothing special about praying that way. 
Um, it's nothing wrong with teaching your children, you know, let's, let's pray, and the kids are learning to put their, fold their hands together. Nothing wrong with doing that. Why? Because they need to have that example before them so that they'll know what prayer means. When, I'm, when you fold your hands, you're going into a different attitude about something. So, um, but there's nothing magical about folding your hands. Uh, there's nothing magical about eyes open or eyes shut. There's nothing special about King James only prayers. And in the same way, there's nothing special about friendly banter. Some people are so uh, anti King James talk that they want to do everything as friendly banter. You know, like God's my buddy, and we're just here to have a little little conversation here together. And next to that is the casual I just prayers. We just. You know, it's it's like saying, you know, I know there's, we should be thinking some pretty deep things right now, but we just want to, you know, say you're really cool, and uh, we just uh, we just love you, and you know, and we just, you know, when when people are saying those things, what's meant by that? We just, uh, and I I say it myself sometimes, and I have to stop and say, why did I say that? It's not that I just want to say this or that. I got a lot of things I want to say, and I want a lot of things I want to do with it. So it's not those kind of prayers either. Let it be the natural posture of humility and genuine desire for the will of God. Don't, don't make it into some ritual that you, you've come up with somewhere. You heard somebody, somebody pray this way, so you're going to pray that way because you think that's the magic way of prayer. There is no magic way to do prayer, period. Prayer is conversation with God. It is a humble heart recognizing the need that it has and, and working with that need. All right. Thoughts or comments about any of that so far? Right. Yes, it's about seeking first. Yeah, I, I remember going to uh, Barbados, and there was a missionary family. We were staying down there, and uh, got up in the morning, and that's a great missionary. I mean, he was a very humble man. And he said, would you like to join me out here with this little patio area? And he said, would you like to join me out here for a cup of coffee and some prayer? Oh, yeah. So we had the Word of God together. We drank a little, a little of the coffee. And then he said, uh, well, shall we pray? I said, yeah. He said, let me ask you something. How's the best way for us to pray this morning? He said, you know, my support level uh, has me at a certain thing, and right now the the dollar against the um, Barbados dollar is not good. And so I'm not getting a good share on mine. Like the dollars were 50 cents to the one Barbados dollar or whatever it was. Anyway, it was a difficulty. And he said, so if I pray for my support level to increase, I'm asking for yours to go down. What do you mean? He said, well, if your dollar is strong against ours, then my support level goes down. Yours is going up. You're, you're having more income. So if I pray that my income will be able to raise so that I can get more done, I'm asking for yours to go down. Man, I, that was the first time I had thought about worldwide things. Because when you are praying for something worldwide, Think of all the different things God has to do to make each of the prayer requests he's hearing from all those different countries and how he's got to work all of those together for the good, for the kingdom of God. And that's where, where we got to go with these things, isn't it, Jeannie? We, we got to look to say, what's, what's the kingdom's principle? What's the kingdom's goal here? Uh, is, is it that I be wealthy? Uh, is it that I be influential to people who don't know Jesus Christ and help them to know Jesus Christ? Well, 
Maybe my wealthy would detract from that. So maybe the better thing for me is to pray for the kingdom to be accomplished in my life. Okay. Well, well, let's talk about times to pray. What have I, what have I done for you here? Time to pray. Okay. Uh, you can have regular appointed times of prayer. Uh, you know, you may get up in the morning and say, you know, I'm usually trying to pray from seven to eight or from six to seven or whatever it is you're, you're praying, uh, six to 6.15 or whatever it is you pray. It's okay to have an irregular appointed time. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, some people pray uh, three to four times a day in regular appointed times. Some will pray first thing in the morning. Some will pray around 10 o'clock. They'll take a 10 o'clock break to pray, maybe five, 10 minutes, but they'll take a 10 o'clock break to pray. They'll break again at noon. They'll break again about three or four o'clock. They'll have another one just before they go to bed. Nothing wrong with having regular appointed times at all. Um, again, it's the heart attitude, not the schedule, okay? But here's one thing we all know is true. Philippians chapter 4 says, be anxious for nothing but in everything. Okay, so that tells me there must be something I'm supposed to do. And if I'm always supposed to be in the attitude of thanksgiving, in everything give thanks, and if I'm supposed to be praying without ceasing, when's the best time to pray? Always. Always. Um, I, I was so impressed with, I was praying with somebody at one point, and I, I prayed no, I asked I ask him if he would pray, and he started, and Lord, and I thought, what a strange way to start, and Lord. It's a, that's as if, so I said to him after, you know, you, you started out by saying, and Lord, yeah. Well, that, that's like there was a prayer that went on before that. That's what it sounded. He said, there was prayer that went on before that. I said, when was that? And he said, the last time I prayed. He said, you're supposed to pray without ceasing. So if I start out in the morning when I wake up and saying, our Father who art in heaven, then the rest of my day is all about that prayer continuing all day long. And I thought, wow, I hadn't thought of that at all. And that's a good plan uh, to be able to have your prayer go on all day long. So it's not wrong to have appointed times. It's not wrong to have times that are spontaneous enough that you can have them any moment. You know, you're traveling in the car, pray. There's a lot of times you can just pray. And then uh, letter C, in response to the Word of God, read, heard, preached, taught, etc., the Word of, is God speaking to us, and prayer is us responding to Him. So you, you're, you're hearing the Word of God. You, you, you got one of those um, audio book prayers, and you're, maybe you're traveling in your car, uh, maybe you're, it's just something you do. I, I know a lot of times I'll be on the treadmill, I'll be listening to the, my audio re- hearing of the Word of God, and there are things that come up. We're, right now I'm going through Ezekiel, and whew, there is some tough stuff in there, okay? And I find myself as I'm going through this saying, oh, Lord, I, I can see we're guilty of that, and I can see what you said you're going to do. That, this is a horrible thing. Please have mercy on us. Show us, lead us, and guide us the way we ought to go in this thing. So prayer is responding to when you hear the Word of God. Someone is sharing with you the Word of God. It's responding to the Word of God. It's, it's, it's your heart open enough that you're always ready to respond to it. And then finally, what's the content of our prayer? That's our subject matter for the rest of the year. We're going to try to learn how does the Bible how, how do the people who prayed in the Bible pray? Because if I learn that, I'm learning to pray in the will of God, and I know that when I'm praying in the will of God, He hears us. And if He hears us, I know we have the requests. I know that if, I, if I'm asking Him while I'm abiding in Christ, He's going to do that. So I want to make sure that I'm involved with the kingdom itself and what the kingdom wants to do. So hopefully what we're going to do this year is kind of encourage each other to have a life of prayer. So, thoughts, comments, see where we're headed with this? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yep. 
And, you know, if you just have a steady reading program, he will open your mind to the things. He, he's not going to misguide you. He's going to show you all the way. He's, he's undertaken to bring you into his kingdom full grown. And whatever it takes to bring you full grown, it's, it's going to take something different from you than it is for somebody else. Just like it is with your own children. You've had kids that, man, this one ate everything on the plate. This one here is such a finicky eater, they didn't eat anything. You didn't know how they even survived because they didn't eat enough of anything to, to make it. There, there was something different that was going on with each one of them, yet they all grew up. And they all grew up to be the people that they are right now. Our Father's going to do the same thing with us. He's growing us up. And you don't have to compare yourself to anybody else or do what anybody else is doing. Read the Word of God. Stay in the Word of God. He'll show you where He wants you to go, show you what He wants to pray for. So just keep steady with it. Yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Hey, let's, let's close in prayer. And as we're praying tonight, uh, anybody can pray that wants to pray. Uh, we, we, we've got a lot of things we need to pray for. Certainly, there are young men and women down these halls that need to know Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. We have young men and women in Berean Christian School and Legacy Christian School that need to know Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. They've got the same kind of problems every other kid ever had in their life. There are some who are bullies. There are some who receive bullies, <laughs> you know. There are some who are bullied and some who are bullies. There are, there are some who really have never figured out that they're not the greatest gift on the earth, and so they, they really want their own will. There are others who feel like they never were going to be a good gift for anything. So all of those things are going on every day here just like they would any place else. So if you're running out of things to pray, remember those, those prayers. Remember Trail Life and uh, uh, American Heritage Girls. Then remember we got a great seniors group. Remember them because they're, they're going through a lot of things right now as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, my. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, let's go to prayer now. And um, so anybody wants to lead us off, go right ahead. Well, I'll close in prayer when I hear a silence.
Father, thank you for the gospel. Think that there is a way to save Gentiles like us, all people out there who are like us. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you will minister grace to us, uh, grace to live, grace to know, grace to understand. We need you. We ask you to fill us with your spirit that those who do not know you would be able to know you. Give us boldness to speak that word. We ask, Father, that in Jesus' name you keep our congregation safe from diseases, from harm, that you give them much wisdom and discernment as they seek their own uh, religious convictions about what they're going to do, Father, their own biblical convictions about how to live life, regardless of what that, that uh, situation is before them, how to work well with their employer, how to, uh, how to be people who know how to govern their own lives. And I thank you for that, Father. We ask that you give us biblical understanding of what you're doing in this world and give us eyes that seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. We do want to be a learning people, Father. We know we're not there yet. But we know that the Holy Spirit will bring us to that place. So we call on you to assist us with that. We think of our brothers and sisters who are in Afghanistan, our understanding, Father, that a good number of the underground church has been wiped out. We want to thank you that they had a place to go to. Thank you for the grace that you've given them. We pray for those, Father, who were able to escape from that. We ask in Jesus' name, grant to them your grace, your safety, your peace. Grant for them uh, freedom from bitterness, for I know what that can lead to for all of them. Thank you for what you're doing. We pray for those who did not make it out of Afghanistan, who wanted to get out. We ask that you keep them safe from harm that you'll give them uh, miraculous deliveries, Father. We'll thank you for that. We pray for brothers and sisters all around the world who are going through a lot of struggles right now, all for the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you're going to do in them. Thank you for the children you've given us the opportunity, Father. We pray for our children that the, the Holy Spirit will be speaking to their hearts deeply. There are so many distractions for our kids, Father, and so many uh, frustrations for them. We ask in the name of Jesus that you'll grant to them they might know and understand Jesus and follow him all the days of their life. And I'm going to thank you for what you will do in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Um, again, I've got these packages. If anybody's interested in those, what I would really suggest, do not. There are sample letters here and sample things to say. Do not word for word them. Uh, put it in your own words. Don't just make a copy of this letter and send it on. If you find something there that is a conviction for you, but again, if, if it's not a conviction, then don't do anything until you had a chance to consider what is your conviction about life, all right? God bless you. We'll see you again. Al, anything we need to know? All right. So if you need one of those packages, let me know.